Hello, and is everyone there? Let's hope so. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Mirror Newspaper Review with me, Fleet Street Fox, and columnist and football writer Darren Lewis. We're going to take you through the best stories in tomorrow's papers and give you some background to help you make sense of the next 24-hour news cycle in all its madness. Um, so in the papers tomorrow, there is another row about Harry and Meghan not being well-behaved royals. Uh, there's some analysis of how Keir Starmer is handling the tricky job of opposition during a national crisis. And would you believe it, I now need a passport to get into my own house. <laughs> For it all, we want you to ask your own questions, ask us the thing that's bothering you, and we'll do our best to answer them at the end, and we'll also try to be polite. Um, but first, it's six months to the day since Boris Johnson announced lockdown. And Keir Ooh. Starmer says we owe everything that went wrong to our woeful choice of prime minister. Now, in April, we had the Blitz Spirit. Then we had a day trip to Barnard Castle. I don't know if you were there or not, but um, I certainly wasn't. Uh, and in May, there was some brass neck in the Downing Street Rose Garden. So that collective sense of sacrifice that I can still vaguely remember for the greater good seems to have been long gone. So, Darren, do you think Keir's right? Is this all down to the character of the man we put in Downing Street? Well, first of all, there's a terrific front page, uh, Susie, I think. It, it kind of tells you everything that we thought even before Boris Johnson took office. Um, you elect a clown and you get a circus. And uh, only, of course, no one's laughing with uh, today the highest daily COVID uh, cases announced since the start of May and jobs at risk and the entire business at businesses at risk. And, you know, the people have lost loved ones and sacrificed the opportunity to be with loved ones uh, at funerals and by bedsides because of this man here. I mean, it has just been a complete shambles from start to finish. And, you know, listen, you can talk a bit about Keir Starmer and his attempts to look presidential in a little while, but I think the serious aspect of this is that this guy here, I think that front page kind of strikes the right balance between parodying this kind of keep calm and carry on attitude that Boris Johnson always seems to have, you know, let's sing land of hope and glory of the virus and uh, uh, tell him that the, the British spirit is going to get us through this while other countries take the correct preventative measures, the disciplined preventative measures to save lives and uh, do what they can to, to cope with the situation. And then you've got him. So there's that distinction. And then, of course, you've got um, the kind of you look at Nicola Sturgeon up in Scotland and the kind of social solidarity that she has with the people up there. And every time you see Boris Johnson give a speech and you see Nicola Sturgeon give a speech, it's almost like chalk and cheese, isn't it? I, I love that. Stop. Uh, say again. Sorry. 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 One of the things that Keir said there doesn't make any sense to me. It's the same kind of mad, faux patriotic logic that Boris Johnson had. We're a great country. This shouldn't have happened to us. Because Britain, you know, we had massive existing public health crises, which made us a sitting duck for coronavirus. Whoever was in charge, we had a massive obesity problem. Yes. Seriously. Yes. Pardon the pun. We had um, uh, inequality. We had diabetes. We had heart disease. We got junk food. We got sedentary lifestyles, bad housing, overcrowding, racism. And then we had this, you know, 10 years of Tory rule, which made all those inequalities infinitely worse than they were. So saying that we were a great country, it shouldn't have happened. Firstly, our greatness is perhaps up for debate. It depends what you're talking about because our health wasn't great to start with. But any prime minister, if you open the door, and Boris Johnson did open the door, he locked down too late, he let COVID in, he didn't close the borders when other countries were. Any prime minister that opened that door, a lot of us were going to die anyway. So how can Keir say, we're a great country, it shouldn't have happened? That's like Boris saying, we're a great country, Brexit will be fine. It doesn't, what doesn't work. It's not logic. I agree, and I, I think agree. he's trying to kind of play along with the kind of British exceptionism that has kind of characterised certainly Boris Johnson's handling of the coronavirus. We will beat this. But you listen to the rhetoric, um, and, and I only kind of half-jokingly make that 
their line about Land of Hope and Glory because I think he has always treated it as though you know, the kind of language that he used suggested that we will win this, we will do this, we will do that. And as you say, when you look at the underlying problems in this country and the issues that have been facing us for so long that have not been dealt with, not been adequately addressed, and then you kind of factor in, you know, at the start, he was always determined not to do what the World Health Organization had suggested, what the scientists were suggesting, what the other countries were doing. And that's that kind of British exceptionalism was kind of what has left us hamstrung, massively so. And again, another reason why that front page is so good, because I think with anybody else, we, we, we probably could have had a chance uh, and Keir Starmer kind of sticking the boot in, but at the same time trying to play along with that kind of rhetoric that Boris uses when instead, yeah. as you say, he should have really just addressed the, the gravity of the situation and left all of that alone. Well, it's really hard to be in opposition when you've got a crisis going on because you can't attack the government too much, but yet you need to tell them when they're going wrong. And I think that the um, the operatives in the back room are going to upload the front page of the Telegraph for people to see. There it is. And speaking of front pages, how completely boring. I know it's a broadsheet, but I mean, that just, ugh, wants to send me to sleep. Their headline, they're on the, on the lead, wage subsidies to replace furlough. They're fairly clear that Rishi Sunak is going to be switching out this scheme, which is ending in a few weeks anyway, of paying 80% of employees' wages, uh, with perhaps paying 50% of employees' wages. Um, if you work half the hours you normally do, then the government will take up the other half of your hours and pay you for work you haven't done, which is all fine and dandy if you're PAYE. I'm self-employed. No one pays me for work I haven't done. You know, and there are five people self-employed. Every boiler fitter, every plumber, Every graphic designer, every actor, every musician who should be doing the, playing the violin for Phantom of the Opera right now is sitting at home twiddling their thumbs, not getting any pay. And this isn't going to help them, is it? No, it's not. And I think when the furlough scheme was announced, you know, I think all of those people were making their case back then and they'll do it again. Now, of course, the subplot to this, of course, is you've got Keir Starmer skewering the prime minister across uh, at the dispatch box and in his presidential suite. And now you've got Rishi Sunak using the Prime Minister as a warm-up act, you know, to kind of come on and, and knock it out of the park uh, tomorrow. But you, there are so many sectors, again, who are going to be screaming for help, the aviation sector, the retail sector, the hospitality sector, all of them have been very vocal about the need to get some kind of help. And it does sell very much as though he is going to announce uh, something similar to this German model where they pay 50% of employees' wages um, rather than the 80% that he's been paying so far. But as you rightly say, there is a huge swathe of this country who are going to be looking at what, he's, what he does tomorrow and be saying, what about us? What do we do? What about what all, those people on, all those people in furlough jobs whose the businesses they work for are going down the tubes. And when this ends, they won't have a job and that business won't exist anymore. So they're, they're paying 50% of someone's wages to keep them sort of ticking over for a bit for a job that doesn't exist. So they're going to end up on the dole anyway, which is infinitely cheaper. And all you've done really is you've helped the boss of that business get through that period. You haven't really done much to help the employee. All right, they've had their wages for a while, but they are fundamentally not getting training help or the other things they need and the djs are out of work as adam barrington points out mm -hmm. night yeah. nighttime economy yeah. is on its knees well i was looking at some of the numbers around furlough you know 9.6 million workers 1.2 million businesses and there's been a cost of 39.2 billion so far um which is more than the nhs budget in monetary terms so i think the 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 money keeps rising, um, but there are still people who are feeling, well, not feeling, who are, who are being left out. And I think this, there's going to be a lot of pressure on him, but he seems to kind of strike this balance in that between um, appeasing some people and obviously the, the critics who want some kind of solution, some kind of blame. And you can bet that every dozen the people who are as you highlighted a second ago, 
left out will on Saturday be forgotten about as everyone kind of trumpets Rishi as the saviour um, of the economy and the guy who could eventually possibly take uh, Boris Johnson's job. Yeah, well, if he keeps handing out money, people like him, don't they? But it's, <laughs> this is what we've got here again in the Daily Express. Rishi's jobs lifeline. He, You know, the Treasury doesn't do anything without Boris and Dominic Cummings' approval. Uh, mm. Sajid Javid, remember, resigned because he wasn't yeah. allowed as Chancellor to do things without Dominic Cummings' approval. So Rishi's jobs lifeline is something that's being briefed out by Rishi's people. And mm. no doubt Boris's people are going, what? This is so unfair because um, <clears throat> he's going to get all the good press. And uh, because you have to as well, you know, it's a, it's a sense of every story, you know, has to be good and bad, good and evil. So you have to have Rishi versus Boris. It's not possible really in a newspaper or a newspaper headline to use the nuance and explain every time Chancellor is doing what he's told to do and mm. taking the credit because he's got a slightly better advisor or press spokesman. Well, we have seen over the, over the recent past, haven't we, Susie, that there have been all this briefing against Boris full stop uh, and the idea that a lot of people have been losing faith in him, uh, suggestions about problems with his personal life. Um, and there does seem to be this movement towards ousting this guy who, let's, let's not kid ourselves, should never have been in the job in the first place, but since then has kind of eroded all the confidence of the people that put him outside number 10, inside number 10 in the first place. So it could well be that regardless of what, you know, where the beef is, if you like, uh, Rishi is the guy who kind of exudes the kind of confidence that this guy absolutely doesn't have. Well, he's smooth, but he's a hedge funder, remember? And I think well, if he were to run for office, there'd be some, there'd be some financial things going on uh, from some of his time uh, in the city uh, that I'm sure would get covered in great depth. Um, but anyway, I think our next paper might be discussing what was on the front of the Telegraph there, which is the Harry and Meghan story. Um, now, they're not royals anymore, and they have uh, been nominated in the, I think it was Prince Harry, was nominated for the Time 100 Most Influential People thing. And they gave this video uh, address in their garden, um, which was really weird because it looked like they were reading an auto cue, but in their own garden, on their own garden bench. Uh, but they had this little script and they read it out and it was all about um, if oh if you were uh, writing for the Daily Mail, you'd say this was woke claptrap. But it was the kind of language we're used to hearing from them about compassion and um, having your voice heard and how much you matter and things like this. Um, and one of the things they've said is that voting is very important and uh, compassion and you don't want to vote for, you know, uh, online negativity, misinformation or hate speech. Now, that all sounds perfectly reasonable to me. I don't I don't think anybody can have a problem. Why would anyone say you should vote for hate speech? You mm. should be voting for more misinformation. I mean, that's what Vladimir Putin would say. It's what Adolf Hitler would say. Uh, but we've had Piers Morgan uh, chip in and say, no, you're saying don't vote for Trump. And you've had some of Trump's people saying this is, you know, they're Britain wokeists. They need to get out and leave. Um, and is this really political? You know, Palace is busy distancing themselves from Harry and Meghan. They're private individuals. They can express an opinion. If they're telling someone to vote and to not be nasty, is that political? Listen, absolutely not. But what I love about Harry and Meghan is the fact that they couldn't care less anyway, whether it is political or not. They are, they are free. They are, they are telling people to vote in probably what is one of the most critical elections in the US in modern times. Because we've seen the genocide of black people in America at the hands of police. We are seeing the, the gun lobby running riot in America. We're seeing, all, we're seeing a president out of control in America. And I think exercising their right to have a voice and to influence young people who otherwise wouldn't use that democratic right for me can only be a good thing i think in the wider context i love the freedom that megan and harry have they're almost free i remember you writing a piece uh earlier this year where you said um someone reads uh, them <laughs> <laughs> i found the reader he's there oh, hi darren uh, you, you wrote a piece about them escaping the prison and, and even when they the, a couple of the other minor royals uh, had had divorces they blamed megan 
for it as well because they always find a reason to to blame Megan. But you know what they've done is escape a dysfunctional family, and what the dysfunctional uh, family's supporters have tried to do is try to put them back in their box. So if you leave, okay, don't take taxpayers' money. So it's all right, fine. We won't. We'll, we'll pay for Frogmore Castle. We'll pay for all the repairs. All right, well, you've got to give up your time. You've got to earn your own money. Okay, we'll do a deal with Netflix. So they do that deal with Netflix. Now they're saying you've got to give up your titles. I really don't think they give a monkeys. I think as far as they are concerned, they want to be free to say the kind of thing that are relevant to young people right now at the moment. Then I think okay. this is particularly I don't, disagree. I don't disagree with any of that. But can you imagine... Uh, if they were still in the royal family, as it were, can you imagine the Queen saying, it's very important everyone should vote? In yeah. fact, she did. She said it before the Scottish referendum, and she was told to say it by David Cameron, as was revealed in a... Uh, um, I'm sorry, I just noticed there's an eyeline on my eyelid. As was revealed <laughs> in a, um, a biography not long ago by David Cameron himself, right? He said... Um, he had a, a word with Her Majesty behind the scenes and then she came out at uh, Balmoral at the church one day and someone in the crowd asked her about the Scottish referendum and she said, I hope people consider things very carefully and it was considered to be an intervention, right, and unprecedented. And she did All she did was said, think carefully. <laughs> and there was a bit of an uproar, but it was okay. And here we have Harry and Meghan, who are individuals saying their own thing and not in any way telling people to vote Biden or vote Trump. They're just saying, right. don't be don't be horrible. <laughs> and we know who the horrible one is. Right. It's obvious what they mean, but they're not telling you what to do. And oh. that's a big row. That's a big problem. It's only a problem and for the people who are intent on vilifying Meghan at every turn. And we know that they exist, Susie. We know that there is this massive movement. She's an outsider. Um, there are other elements. Every woman who marries into the royal family is an outsider, though. They've all been outsiders. Kate was vilified. Diana's vilified. The Empress Matilda, who was actually part of the royal family, was vilified in the in the twelfth century. Darren, it's what we do with our royal women. What amazes me about an intelligent woman about Meghan is that she didn't even Google this stuff before she married Harry, because this was going to happen. Yeah, it but, was always yeah. going to happen. And yeah. she didn't seem to realise the constitutional role, I think. Yeah, it, and people it, 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 but, but what you mean by that, when you say the constitutional role, what, what you we mean by that is that she's supposed to sit at the window and stare out so that we can take photographs of her. Sit in front yeah, of the I don't of approve heart. of that constitutional yeah. role, but that mm -hmm. is the constitutional role. Because if Kate would come out and say, hey, everyone, wasn't the Northern Ireland conflict awful, then that caused an absolute ruckus for politicians. But, but, but here's the thing, Susie. This is the thing. If, she, if that happened, if this happened, that, what they've said is, fine, we don't want to live by those conventions. So you keep them and we will go and live our lives. And everyone is basically going into that world because, again, in a dysfunctional family, you try to put somebody back where you can control them and nobody can control them. And that's why they are so upset. That's why we're seeing so many columns being written about Harry and Meghan, because people are trying to put them back into their box and they are not allowing that to happen. Well, it's not just that. They're still, even having left their royalty behind, their stardom, their fame, their notoriety, their money earning potential still predates on the fact that they have that royal connection. And here we've got the independent front page, charges over the Brian Taylor killing. This is the young black woman shot in her bed by police officers who were trying to raid a drug dealer 10 miles away. They completely ruined it. They unloaded dozens of bullets into this young woman's house. They killed her. They're finally charging the people involved. Now, Megan has spoken out about Brianna Taylor's death. She's mentioned her name. She's mentioned the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests that are going on in the States. She could not have done any of that had she remained the Duchess of Sussex, if you like, and, and part of the royal family. That would have been just so not possible for her to do. So I'm glad she's left and has the freedom to talk about something that would matter to anybody, never mind just her because she's biracial. But <clears throat> the reason that you don't talk about this stuff is that you can make it infinitely worse as a royal. Um, 
and she can talk about it as a private citizen. But, you know, what does it mean, even though they've left the royal family now, if she were to criticise these charges in some way, to say they weren't good enough or there should be more or any ultimate convictions, that still causes problems even now, diplomatically, between Britain and the UK, doesn't it? Well, they do, but, you know, she sees herself first as a biracial woman. She sees herself first as somebody who sees injustice and she wants to be able to address it. And I think sometimes all of us go around with our eyes closed to certain things because it doesn't fit with convention to be able to address them. And, and she doesn't want to be that person. She doesn't want to sit quietly while she sees all of these things happening around her that she can't talk about. And I think that she is doing a great disservice to these issues because when they get people angry, when they get people wound up and force them to the laptop to start bashing out six, seven hundred words, they raise awareness and they get people like us talking about them. And we get they get people like us focused on the, the absolute scandal uh, around it. She gives it a different element. So I, I will never criticise either Harry or Meghan because I love the, the independence that they have free from an archaic institution that is basically intent on silencing them and using the power of the fourth estate, if you like, to, to, to put pressure on them to be quiet. And they won't have that. They will go and do what they like, how they like, and more power to them on that. Yeah, fair enough. I think that's still going to cause them problems, to be fair. <clears throat> I think they'd be naive to think leaving the royal family means they never have to worry about the royal family again. Um, I, I, but, I, I think, can we, can we talk about Brianna Tate before we move on? Are you, yeah, yeah. Are you okay with that? Because I think that we, it's on the other side of the water and fine, but I think we, we've seen, obviously George Floyd and we've seen Jacob Blake as well. And this, the background to this, everybody knows, as you, as you've highlighted, you know, that one officer fired 16 times into this woman who was sleeping. You know, another double figures. This is a scandal. One officer has been charged out of the three that were in her home. They broke it, they broke it. They went into her home. She was asleep in her bed. They were chasing the, chasing the other guy. The one guy that they charged was charged with wanton endangerment, which is a, a relatively lowly charge. And, and there's been outrage. And there is a concern now that it could lead to a fresh outbreak of violence because people on the other side of the Atlantic are saying, how many more people have to die without any accountability whatsoever? And we're not just seeing it on that side of the Atlantic, we're seeing it on this side of the Atlantic as well. And we need to get to a place where there is accountability for this sort of thing. And we're just not seeing it. That's why what Megan is doing is so important. I, I, I accept absolutely what you're saying about the, the, the problems that could come up down the line. But, you know, for black people, who cares? You know, black people say we need that help if it means her voice adds that power to that, not just debate, but to call for action. Like all of the sports stars and high profile figures that have been speaking out this evening, absolutely. Yeah. I've been a message from the people behind the scenes to segue into the next story. <laughs> now, from the brutal manslaughter slash murder who knows of a young innocent woman in america to the issue of kent <laughs> which is a bit different so i can't segue i was going to segue by pointing out there is no segue but <clears throat> here we have going back to brexit and that wonderful wonderful uh problem we have with the fact we can't patrol the one border we need to patrol um Michael Gove has today told uh, Houses of Parliament that not only will there be 7,000 trucks waiting in Kent for anything up to two days with rotting food in the back, which, as I'm sure everyone will absolutely love, never mind the rotting uh, trafficked individuals who might be stuck in the back of some of those lorries, but uh, you may need the passport now in order to enter Kent from the rest of the UK. Now, I live in Kent, all right? All right, I don't drive an HGV, but next time I go down the M20, if I ever leave Kent again, which I haven't since, well, pretty much since February, but if I ever leave Kent again and want to return, I may have to get some kind of travel passport signed off by Michael Gove that I have a right to enter my own home. Now, this wasn't on the side of the bus, Darren. What are they playing at? How can they possibly justify a travel passport for one of the United Kingdom's counties? 
And, and, and here's another question for you, Susie. Is where you live now part of France or is France part of Kent? <laughs> you know, people don't realise this, right? Kent uh, is has the symbol of a white horse on a red flag, right? Which is right. Horsa. It's the symbol of Horsa, who was a Viking king who, with his brother, invaded from Europe <laughs> and then fought the king of the Britons, Vortigern, and blackmailed him into giving them Kent in order not to slaughter him and then slaughtered him anyway, right? And that's how Kent actually existed as a thing, as, a, as an original county. And then, so we invaded uh, the Jutes and the Saxons from Europe and we stole it. And then when William the Conqueror invaded again in 1066, right, we fought William the Conqueror back out. The men of Kent picked up sticks. He came up the M20 and we pushed him back down. I said, no, get lost you're French, whatever. Well, actually, he's Norman, so kind of Viking as well. But anyway, we pushed him back out and then he had to come up through Sussex because he wasn't allowed in. Anyway, point is, Kent has never really been particularly British. We have always been quite a bit European. Tunbridge Wells and Canterbury and all its surrounding villages voted to remain in the Brexit referendum. And Nigel Farage is from the other side of the Medway, the people that didn't put the conqueror out. We don't approve of people from over there. So I would suggest that um, Kent is pretty much French. We do get French radio here. And we also uh, had lots of trade contacts with the French for centuries for their brandy and lace. And we're shortly going to be reflooding Romney Marsh so we can start the smuggling up again, because that's going to be a vital, vital service to the people of Britain, I think, once this starts kicking in. So in the next three months, you're going to build what, what was it, a 380 mile border wall, is it? Is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then we're going, to, we're going to join up with Scotland and Northern Ireland and <laughs> form the own sort of you know, United States of uh, Remain, whatever it might be. I mean, so, on, yeah, on, on, on the serious, I mean, the, you know, the, this kind of sums up the lunacy uh, of, of, I mean, I saw Michael Gove talking about it and I immediately saw the, the, the the reaction to it, which was one of widespread incredulity to this. I mean, really, you live there. What's your reaction? My reaction <laughs> is I'm a long way from where the lorry park would be, but I've got to go past that lorry park, and that lorry park is going to block up the main artery into the place where I live. Um, and anyone in the country is going to be getting fresh produce that comes in from the Channel and from Dover. And it doesn't really matter whether you live in Kent or whether you live somewhere else. Your uh, chains of supply are going to be severely affected. And this apparently kicks in whether or not we have a deal. So it's all pretty grim news, no matter what, because this isn't now the worst case scenario project fear we were promised it was going to be. This is now project definitely happening uh, in a couple of months, actually, guys. Sorry, we didn't mention it, uh, which is not, not what was on the side of the team. How do they work out the logistics then for policing this? In three months. <laughs> no, there are no logistics. It's just the M20 and they're going to park on it and that's it. And if you live on one side and work on the other side, it's going to be like the Northern Irish border. You won't be able to cross and there'll be bombing campaigns and all sorts. But I'm very much looking forward to those Londoners having, you know, day trips down to what will shortly become known as Margot rather than Margate <laughs> and uh, uh, Chateau de Ver rather than Dover Castle. So, you know, I'm all for it. It also makes us sound like uh, we're, we're very foreign and uh, cosmopolitan. There is a question, apparently, from Mohammed. What about football stadiums? I presume this is not to do with lorry parks, or are you suggesting, Mohammed, that lorries are going to park in football stadiums? No one else is going to football stadiums. So maybe, that, maybe, maybe that's the solution, Darren. You know, no more sports. Let's just park the lorries in all the stadiums. Well, I was talking about all the industries um, that were affected um, by um, the COVID crisis and uh, the, the sporting industry massively affected the football industry crying out for help. But of course, there's not a lot of sympathy for an industry that is spending huge amounts of money on football players by a trading. Uh, I think as far as football is concerned, though, they are facing a big problem because fans are not going into the stadium, fans are not... Um, subsidising the clubs and without that revenue they are struggling and many clubs and many jobs will go to the wall as a result so, but as we've seen the culture sector is trying to prioritise the arts and the theatres and whatever far and away above sports 
that's, and that's the reason why the outlet for chocolate in particular, in particular is so bleak at the moment. So yeah, especially your really small local club. Now, Megan asked one of the guys to get a food jet and food jet mask for preventing COVID without a vaccine. vaccine. Without a vaccine. Because, oh. Megan, I happened to see this earlier on, flu, something like doubles your chance of dying from COVID. If you catch them both, you're absolutely stuffed, Megan. You're stuffed, woman. Get your flu jab if you can. The vaccine for flu doesn't cover you particularly efficiently. It doesn't It's not an absolutely perfect cure for flu or prevention, but it will help you an awful lot. You probably won't get it. And then if you do get COVID, you'll probably survive. But mm. if you get flu and then you get COVID, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I had a nurse talking today about the fact that obviously around about the winter, around about this time, they're preparing for uh, the flu intake. And obviously with COVID uh, cases occupying beds in hospital, that is going to make the logistics particularly difficult this summer. Not as you say, it kind of underlines the reason why the flu jab is even more important this winter than ever. Yeah, exactly. So get your jabs, Megan, and everybody else who's watching, both of you, whoever they are. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you for joining me, Darren. And uh, now everybody else, get yourselves to bed. Get your head down. It's a school night. More hard work from home tomorrow. And if you're a university student who's been told to stay at university but study from home but don't go home, um, talk to your mum because there's no point waiting for Boris Johnson to help you out. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank Bye. You.